Pain is usually the central symptom in fibromyalgia and is often a problem for people with CFS as well. For people with fibro, pain is generally felt all over the body, though it can start in one region and spread, or move from one area to another. It may be accompanied by related problems such as tingling and burning or numbness in the hands, arms, feet, legs, or face. For people with CFS, pain may be experienced in the joints or more commonly as an overall body pain sometimes described as feeling like being run over by a truck. Pain in fibro and CFS can have a variety of causes, including overactivity, deconditioning, non-restorative sleep, anxiety, and stress. For this reason, it is best managed with a variety of strategies. This video and the next one will describe major options for creating a pain management plan. This video discusses three approaches, medications, pacing, and exercise. Medications. If you decide to treat fibro or CFS pain using medications, it's important to have realistic expectations. Medications this is in the cautions area now. Medications don't eliminate pain, but they may reduce it for a period of time in some patients. Because no medication is consistently helpful for people with FM and CFS, and because pain relievers sometimes lose effectiveness over time, experimentation is usually required. For all these reasons and because of side effects and the possibility of addiction, our medical advisor, Dr. Lapp, well-known CFS-FM physician, recommends that drug therapy for pain in fibro and CFS is to be avoided if possible. But if you're interested in his recommendation for pain meds, check out the Medications for Pain page on the website that he and I teamed up to create called Treating Chronic Fatigue Syndrome and Fibromyalgia. Here it is down here, treatcfsfm.org. Medications may be helpful for two other pain conditions often experienced with, uh, by people with fibro and CFS, myofascial pain uh, and nerve pain. Myofascial pain refers to pain localized in specific muscle, muscles or fascia called trigger points, not to be confused with tender points that are used to diagnose fibro. Myofascial pain may be treated with medication, physical therapy such as massage, and myofascial release and the injection of local anesthetics into trigger points. Nerve or neuropathic pain involves a burning or electric shock sensation felt most commonly in the hands and feet. This type of pain is often treated with anti-seizure medications, such as Neurontin. Now we're going to go on to talk about pacing and exercise. First, pacing. Pacing for pain. One frequent cause of pain is overdoing or having an activity level that is beyond a person's limits. Pacing is the antidote. Pacing offers a way to bring stability and control by keeping activity level within the limits imposed by illness. Pacing can involve a variety of strategies, which are discussed in detail in our pacing video series. Let me describe some of them for you now. The first is scheduled rest. Probably my favorite and the most popular pacing strategies among people in our program, daily scheduled rest breaks taken regardless of symptoms. This is the strategy that we usually recommend people try first, and we've devoted a whole video to it in the uh, pacing video series. <clears throat> Second, short activity periods and task switching. Here are two strategies in one. The first means divide tasks into small segments, alternating activity and rest. And the second means alternating activities among different intensities, light, medium, and heavy. Third, time of day. People with CFS and fibro usually have better and worse times of day. You can get more done if you schedule more demanding activities for your best time. I remember how I discovered that, which was in exercise. 
Uh, it took me a long while, but I finally recognized that if I went out on daily walks in the morning, I experienced a much higher level of symptoms than usual. But if I did my walks in the afternoon, it didn't. In, they didn't intensify my symptoms. Next, uh, delegating and simplifying. You can get things accomplished by passing them on to others, that's delegating, or doing them in a less elaborate way or less frequently. Mental and social limits. The idea of limits applies to mental and social activity, not just to physical activity. You can avoid your symptoms, avoid symptoms if you honor your limits for mental activity such as reading and working on the computer and social events, uh, particularly the setting in which you get together with other people and also the number of other people. This principle also applies to stress, emotions, and sensory overload. So I put it here just to indicate that when you're thinking about pacing, that means thinking about limits. And you may th first think of limits on physical activity, but it's also good to think about limits on mental activity, social activity, and also the effects of stress, emotions, and sensory information. Next, what we call special events. Relapses are frequently caused by non-routine events, such as a vacation and the end of year holidays. In the US, that's Thanksgiving to New Year's. By following three guidelines described in our video on special event strategies, you can reduce or even eliminate relapses caused by these special times. And we have a video uh, about called uh, 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 Prevention of Relapses uh, House Guests. And it's about how uh, a woman who had uh, for several years experienced six months relapses uh, when her daughter and granddaughter came to visit her and how she used the uh, three rules that are in the uh, <clears throat> special events video and uh, eliminated the uh, relapse. So it took her two days of rest after the end of the uh, uh, visit from her relatives to get back to normal instead of six months. And lastly, uh, detailed understanding. Uh, we found people do better if they gain a detailed understanding of their limits. For example, uh, understanding how much housework you can do without intensifying your symptoms, uh, how much shopping, uh, how far uh, you can drive, how long you can stand up, uh, your mental activity, like how long you can stay on the computer, time with people, and sensitivity to things like noise, light, food, and chemicals. With knowledge of that, uh, those uh, limitations, you can reduce your symptoms by staying in within the various limits. Okay, that's it for pacing for pain. Now let's go on to talk about exercise. There we are. Exercise is one of the most commonly prescribed treatments for fibro and can be helpful for CFS as well. An exercise program done regularly can help reduce stiffness, counteract deconditioning, and improve one's outlook. <clears throat> Here are some guidelines. First, individualize your program. Your ex exercise program should be tailored to your unique situation. The type, duration, and intensity of exercise will depend on the severity of your illness. For example, we have one person on, in our program who has a very severe case of CFS and is bedbound, and her initial uh, exercise program consisted of raising her arms above her head several times a day. Second, set realistic goals. <clears throat> Each uh, exercise has a different purpose for CFS and fibro than it does for healthy people. Healthy people can set high goals and push themselves, <clears throat> but that approach is likely to make symptoms worse for people with CFS and fibro. An appropriate exercise <clears throat> goal, excuse me, <clears throat> for CFS would be to improve fitness enough to make daily activities easier. And uh, that's what the uh, the woman who I mentioned a minute ago did. Her reason for raising her hands above her head was to make it easier for her to wash her hair. And by doing the uh, hand raising for about a month, she uh, succeeded. For fibromyalgia, an appropriate goal might be the same as for CFS, plus using exercise to reduce stiffness and pain. 
Third, start low and go slow. <clears throat> Begin by finding a safe level of exercise, one that is matched to your current level of functioning and which does not intensify your symptoms either afterwards or the next day. Uh, the reason for mentioning that is that effects of activity can often be delayed. Our medical advisor, Dr. Lapp, head of the Hunter Hopkins Clinic in Charlotte, starts his patients with stretching. <clears throat> if that is tolerated, he moves on to light resistance exercise, uh, beginning with eight ounce weights or uh, stretchy rubber bands like TheraBands. <clears throat> Then light aerobic activities such as walking in place, walking uh, short distances at a comfortable pace, riding a stationary bike or water walking in a pool, and finally full aerobic activities such as brisk walking, biking, or swimming. Periods of activity should be alternated with rest so that several minutes of exertion is followed by an equal or greater amount of time resting. For example, walk for five minutes, then sit for five minutes. The length of activity and rest periods will vary from person to person, but might be as little as one to three minutes. The goal of the exercise program <clears throat> is to have a sustainable level of effort that you can do several times a week, typically every other day, without worsening your symptoms. If your program triggers a flare, reduce it by 50% or return to a level that you were able to tolerate previously. Fourth, use logging and devices. You can evaluate your activity by keeping records and by using a pedometer and or a heart rate monitor. An exercise log, which can be very simple, can enable you to associate activity and symptoms. Uh, you can, on your log, note the time and duration of the exercise, its intensity on a scale of 1 to 10, and your symptom level before, during, and after. You can use a pedometer, also called a step counter, to measure your overall activity level. Dr. Lapp believes that between 1,000 and 5,000 steps a day is a good range for many people with CFS and fibro. You can hear more about pedometers on our video uh, on that topic titled uh, Pedometers. It's uh, one in the pacing series. You can use another device down here, heart rate monitor, to help you avoid the intensification of symptoms that results from having too high a heart rate. <clears throat> Activity beyond a threshold triggers flares, so keeping your heart rate below that threshold prevents flares. For information on how to determine your threshold and strategies for staying within it, see in another video, uh, uh, on, uh, this one on heart rate monitors, it's another video in the pacing series, and it's titled Heart Rate Monitors. And lastly, I'd like to uh, pass on a few thoughts about posture and movement. People with fibromyalgia can help reduce their pain by experimenting with how they hold their body and how they move. Many find that staying in one position for an extended period of time, sometimes as little as 20 or 30 minutes, increases stiffness and intensifies pain. Moving periodically can help, as can limiting the length of time spent doing repetitive motions, like chopping vegetables. Being attentive to posture can help as well. Some people with fibro tend to slouch, which puts, puts tension on muscles in the neck and shoulders. The antidote is to sit up straight, holding the shoulders back and tucking in the chin. So there are some ideas on medications, pacing, and exercise as treatments for pain. The next video describes seven more strategies for you to consider.